Cross Life Broadcasting Taking the Gospel Around the World I did get to meet Daniel several years ago. He didn't tell you about my favorite experience with him, that I think that he had me sitting in the courthouse somewhere with a white wig on my head um, and playing a, a part of a guy that didn't even believe in God. And uh, so uh, in a movie that he asked me that I want to see it, and I'm like, no, I don't want to see it. I, I got the, the pictures of it, and it was truly amazing, but you have a visionary pastor. I want to give you just tonight something the Lord has laid on my heart, and I want to tell you how to encourage yourself in the Lord. If you don't know how to get a touch of God in your own life, this revival is going to do nothing for you. When the revival is over, so will the revival for your life be. If you, when the last preacher comes, you have some phenomenal men that are coming after me. Uh, Pastor Alan Green is a wonderful communicator of the gospel. Wayne Miller, he is a heavy hitter, and I'm excited about uh, uh, you going to be blessed by his ministry. He's going to take you into the deep things of God and truly has a great place. But I'm going to share with you where God's laid me to go through. And in my story tonight has a, a, a message that I've placed that I've been. Let me say how good it is to have our church with us, wonderful people from the Morsel Church of God. I do appreciate them. For being here, I think I have a couple of my elders here tonight. Uh, Brother Edwin uh, is one of my elders at my church. Brother Travis and Brother Jason are part of my elders in our church, and I'm thankful for these guys. Also, wonderful workers, Sunday school teachers, laborers, harvest in our church together. Grab your Bibles, First Samuel chapter 30, verse 4. Grab your, and I want to share with you how to encourage yourself in the Lord. Uh, I believe God's going to speak to you tonight. If you get there, let's stand. Always do that in honor of the Lord. Uh, and what God has. We have a, a nation that's divided right now. We have a country that's going through a lot. We have a people that are discouraged. We have a, a community that needs a touch from the Lord. We have churches that are, are struggling. We have people, we have churches every day that are closing their doors. They're putting for sale signs on the front of them. They're shutting their doors. And they're selling the property and churches are being disbanded. Homes are falling apart. Families are being wrecked with divorce with abandonment. Our churches are almost discouraged. We ourselves are going through crises in our own life. And we come to God's house, and when we come to God's house, we don't know what to do because we're so discouraged and we're so cast down. But I want to share with you tonight about a message that God's laid on my heart in a place that I've been. First Samuel 30, And then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept. And they, had, they had no more power to weep. Have you ever been to a place where you couldn't cry no more? David's two wives were taken captives, Ananim and Jezerites, Abigail, the wife of Nabal and the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him. Because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abathar the priest, Amalek's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abathar brought thither the ephod to David, and David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them. Without fail, you will recover all. Let's pray this night. Father, one more time, a great honor and privilege to be at this great church. A church with wonderful history, a church with the hand of God that's on them, a church that has people that love you, Lord, and people that desire your presence. We felt your touch tonight in this service as we sang, Lord, and we worship. We felt your presence in this place. And tonight I don't expect anything more and anything less than you come and visit us in the remainder part of this service. Lord, I thank you for your presence and your grace and your mercy to what you're going to do in this house tonight. And Lord, when we leave this place, we're going to say, surely it was good to be together with God's people. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name. This name and everybody said amen and amen you may be seated tonight as you sit down don't you look at your neighbor and say we're going to learn how to encourage ourselves in the Lord we're going to learn <laughs> you know what I've learned is is you can't depend on the praise team to always lift your spirit you can't depend on the preacher to always lift your soul you can't depend on the church service for you always to come out of here feeling better because I've been in church services where I actually felt worse when I went home. 
I, I, I've actually been in places, and, and I was the one preaching. So how does that tell you? I, I've been in church services before where I have walked, and I have wondered, where is God at, and where are you doing? And, and I, I came in defeated, and I left defeated. I, I came in discouraged and weeping and hurting and broken in spirit that I didn't know what to do. But revival is something that I find is a special time for the church. It isn't for the world. It isn't for the people out there in the center, man. It's for the church. It's for God the place a defibrillator on our heart and get our heart back beating again for him because somewhere in the process of life we become dead and cold and and dry and and come through the motions the formality of things as i said i've been at my church for nine years there's been up times good times bad times ugly times everything in between but in all of that there's been someone that's been faithful and that is god and god will always be faithful when people aren't faithful when things ain't faithful when everything going difficult and, and you don't have no victory in your soul, you can still come to God looking for Him for the grace that you need. I love those times where I experienced the blessing of God. I love, I'm Pentecostal, my mama danced the aisles when I was in her belly. I was dancing the aisles before I ever was born. I love being in a spirit-filled church. I chewed on the back of the pews when I was a kid, gnawed on them, had teeth marks on them. I used to, we used to have revivals that went in five and seven eight and nine weeks at a time and we didn't take Friday off and we didn't take Saturday off and we went from Sunday to Sunday every day regardless if we were tired the preachers preached we shouted we danced we glorified God and we got up and did it again and we come in God's house and we continue to magnify God now it's hard to get people to come to Sunday night service and Wednesday night service our love for God isn't the same anymore I'll call a revival man we all get on our knees and pray, Lord, let somebody show up and come out and desire more of you. I love the blessing of God. I love the shout. I love the experience where you just feel the presence of God overshadowing you. It just runs up and down your spine. You got them goosebumps. You, you feel encouraged. You feel that you can run through the troop. You can leap over the wall. You can defeat every devil in hell. You can sucker punch him in the face and knock him in the floor because you're walking in victory, power, and authority and the anointing of God is just almost like you're leaving puddles behind you because you got so much of God working in your life. I love that. But those times are not always the case. Those times are not always. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's challenging. Sometimes it's tough. Sometimes it's hard work. It's, it's, it's a place to find happiness that you can't always find it. You look for it, but you don't know where it is. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I, 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 I want more of God, and I desire more for God's people. And any pastor worth his salt and worth it, the, the call and the anointing on his life feels the burden to lead people into the manifest presence of God. And in that, but the problem is we're depressed we're overwhelmed we're discouraged 16 uh, to 18 million people a year are diagnosed with depression we're discouraged we're cast down we're beat down my mama used to call it a valley she didn't call it depression she said I'm in a valley right now I'm in a tough place I'm in a hard place and, and that place that she called was the place that she knew she wouldn't stay there long but for some reason we've decided to build a house in the valley we've decided to take Take up residence in a place of discouragement. And when we sing the song, nobody knows the trouble I see. And we come in cast down. We walk out cast down. And we say, where are you at, Lord? We talk about this depression. We see our young people are depressed. When I was 12 years old, I didn't know what depression was. I was climbing trees and, and riding bicycles. But now our kids are depressed. And, 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 and our young people are depressed. And the number one killer of our teenagers is suicide. And taking their own life. You see these things that, that's going on. Number one is car accidents. Two is suicide. They're taking their own life because there is no hope in us going on. We have conflict between whites and blacks and we have conflicts between rich and poor and, and we have conflict between people and everywhere we are we're dissatisfied and we're frustrated and all of that aggravation that we've been dealing with at home comes over in the church.
church and we sit like little wounded wooden Indians on the pews and don't know more and more where God's at than anything. They tell us God's here, but we don't know God's here because we don't feel Him. We don't experience Him. We don't know where He's at. We walk home and we feel more discouraged and then we decide, I don't know if I want to go back to church or I don't know what I want to do. We go buy a bass boat and we go buy a car and a motorcycle and we try to find something else. Some of our wives have gone and found another man and our men have gone and found another woman to try to find happiness. And at the end of the day, we can't find it because there's a hole on the inside of us that only God can fill. And we've got to realize that God wants to bless his people. God wants to touch his people. God wants to fill us up with his glory. But we got to stop sitting there thinking that somebody else is going to take us to that place. You're going to have to learn to dance if nobody else is dancing. You're going to have to learn to praise if nobody else is praising. You're going to have to have a song in your heart if there ain't no song in the church. Sing, Lord, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Hallelujah. Somebody right now just bless the Lord. Hallelujah. If we ought to concern ourselves, our problems is, is our life is overwhelmed with discouragement and troubles. The good news is God gives us insight to our human condition and our terrible, hard, and, and frustrating life. The Scriptures teaches us that God intends us to have life and have it more abundantly. Not walk through life like it's in the mullet grub. Not walk through life like it's hard and there is nothing that's good at all. Scripture tells us that when you face troubles, you should count it all joy. Hallelujah. He says whatever you face, whatever you go through, whatever challenges. Now the problem is this. It's hard to do that in them places. I'm preaching to real people. I've been there. I've been in places in my life, man, that the dark clouds covered me and I couldn't see a light array in anywhere I found. It was dark discouragement, death, and despair. But in the middle of that, guess what I had to do? I had to trust God's Word. And it wasn't based on my feelings. It wasn't based on what I thought about it. It wasn't based on what I saw, what I heard, and what I was experiencing. I said, Lord, what I see is temporary. But what I cannot see is eternal. There's something working on the inside of me for a far greater purpose than I can understand. But I'm going to bless you. I'm going to worship you. I'm going to lift my hands and praise you in the middle of it when I don't even feel it. Hallelujah. Now, I remember, now I'm just going to preach this tonight. I preach at my church and I just tell it like it is and I even wore a suit and tie tonight for you guys. Uh, uh, but in all of that, I want to tell you, I remember being in church years ago where people would shout and praise God. And there would only be three messages. It would be salvation, it would be healing, or the Holy Ghost. And that's the only three it was. And it was the same three every week. Some were changing it up. But it didn't matter who it was. We preached the message on salvation salvation, we got in the altars and shouted. We didn't, we, we didn't need healing. But there was a message on healing and we got in the altars and we praised and we shouted because we knew that God was a God of healing. That God would answer us and take care of us. The problem is we don't know how to praise the Lord anymore. We don't know how to lift our hands up and worship the Lord anymore. We're waiting on the praise team to do it. We're waiting on the musicians to do it. We're looking at them like move me if you can. I'm going to tell you, it, they are not cheerleaders but they are up here to lift up the name of Jesus Christ you better have enough God in the pew to lift you up regardless of what's going on there man I tell you people all around me I, I, they look for somebody else to get there our culture, we're in Morrisville. Morrisville's growing, powerful city. Great things are happening. There's a lot going on. But in Morrisville, there's a, there's a divide, it seems like. There's people that are wanting more entertainment in church than they want the Spirit. They are. I don't know where it is here, but I know it in my town that they would rather have a light show and a rock band, people sitting up singing in the country bar or the, rock, or the bar the night before and getting up on the stage singing in church because they're good musicians and singers. Half-dressed like girls, boys that don't know if they are girls or boys. <laughs> it's the truth. Go to the largest churches and look at what you see. 
There is no sense of holiness. There is no sense of morality. There is no sense of God's standard of His Word. But everybody's being entertained. And everybody's enjoying what's going on. And everybody's wives swapping. And everybody's doing this and doing that. And they're having a good time at church and enjoying themselves. And then they go home in their little small groups and they drink a little liquor and they do that. And then they come back to God's house and we wonder why we're depressed, why we're discouraged, why there is no life. Because we have disconnected ourselves from God's Word, His truth of His Word. The Bible tells us in this world you're going to have tribulation, you're going to have trouble, you're going to have problems, but the, pro the, the truth is, he said, I have overcome this world and you're going to overcome it because Jesus lives in you. John 10.10 10 says, the thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and destroy, but he said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly, praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. I want to look at, I want to just share a few things. I don't, I don't have it on PowerPoint tonight, but if you'd like to take notes, something you need to write down. I had to learn this in my life. Something you need to remember, something that you need to always call in your heart. This is, this is something I had experience to share with you. Number one, there comes times in everyone's life where you have to confront the unexplainable absences of God. There's a season... When God gives no explanations, only promises His Word. There comes a time where you have got to confront the absence of God and wondering where is He at? What is He doing? Why don't I feel Him? Why don't I experience Him? Much of the journey, you can write this down, tweet it, post it, Facebook or whatever. Much of the journey to heaven is made in the dark. You walk by faith and not by sight. If you're going on this walk with God based upon what you feel, you will be discouraged. If you go on this life based on what you see, you're going to be bipolar. Up and down and up and down and up and down. Because circumstances change. Happiness is required to happenings. If things are not happening, then you have no happiness. It isn't God says, I don't promise you happiness. He said, but I promise you joy. Joy is not regardless of what's going on, how it is. It's based on who who God is. And there's times in your life you need to do is trust in the character of God. I can't experience. I don't know where God's at. I don't know what he's doing. But God is omniscient. Meaning he knows all. He is all knowledgeable. He knows what I'm going to face today, tomorrow, next week, and next month. I don't know where he's at. I know that he is omnipotent. The devil has limitations. People say, I've been fighting the devil. I heard this preacher one time. He said, you ain't fighting Satan. You fighting some third grade potato pillar. You ain't. You aren't fighting the devil himself. He's only at one place at one time. But that old demon, that old foul spirit that's coming against your soul, you've got to understand that God is with you at all places times. If I make my bed in hell, you are there with me. If I take the wings of the morning and go into the place, they're even there where you be with me. If I'm in the cancer ward, you are there. If I'm laying in the ICU, you are there. If I'm in the, in the funeral home, you are there. If I'm looking at my foreclosed house, I'm looking at my family that's lost, I'm looking at my wife that walks out, you are there. I will trust you. I will hold true to you because God says nothing is too hard for me. I will be everywhere you are at. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will be a friend that sticks closer than a brother and there will be times in your life that you can't see God but you've got to trust his character. Hallelujah. You've got to understand that he is immutable meaning he ain't like our government. He ain't like our family and our friends meaning that he does not change. God is the same today yesterday and forever and if God helped you out of the mess you was in last month, last year, last decade, he's the same God that will bring you through what you're facing, he's the same God that took care of mama, he's the same God that took care of grandma, he's the same God that took care of the church and he's going to still take care of the church the church ain't going nowhere, the church is blood bought by Jesus Christ there is a church that ain't going to bow, there's a church that ain't going to bend this knee, that's going to say yes what? I will serve the Lord. I will put my heart and trust in Him regardless of what's going on in our life. Because God don't change. 
You understand, not only is he is holy, he is righteous. He manifests his righteousness by the way he is. He is sovereign. Means that I can't change God's mind. You can't change God's mind. My troubles can't change my God's mind. He is loving. He is merciful. He has a trinity that God himself is in three equal persons. The Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Jesus walked on earth, but he said, I got to go back to the Father. I'm going to send another. Guess who the another was? It was the Holy Spirit is the same as the Father same as the son he lives inside of us and he says that he shall fill you with power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses under Jerusalem Judea and Samaria he said but I'm going back because I'm going to pray to the father guess what pastor may not be able to answer the phone mama daddy brother sister husband and wife but I got Jesus Christ that is praying to my father that's calling my needs out saying I'm calling my son's name hallelujah I want to talk to you just for a moment about this and, and the story of Samuel. Why don't you look and think about how you got to encourage yourself in the Lord. The Bible tells us this, that let me give you the, the background of it because I believe the context of what's going on is important. David's running from his own king. Saul is the king. Saul's trying to take David's life. The Saul is envious of him. He's hunting him down, trying to kill him. Saul is eaten up with envy and paranoia. He's mistakenly thinks David is trying to steal his throne. He tries to take David's life on several occasions, and David escapes it. He throws javelins and spears at him. David flees to the land of the Philistines. These are the enemies of Israel. He goes out amongst the enemy of Israel to hide from the people of God, from Israel. And in that, he's looking, soldiers are out there, he's fighting for the Philistines as mercenaries. The Philistines go and they fight for the Israelites and David and his army are sent home and when they arrive, they're at a temporary home called Ziklag. Ziklag is where the Amalekites uh, and a band of marauders have raided their town. David comes back to Ziklag and when he gets to Ziklag, he says, Hey, my children are gone. My wives are gone. My family's gone and they've burned my town down. They've taken everything of any value and of any purpose at all. Me and my wife went to Charleston the past last week and for her birthday, and we went down there and went through some of the plantation places. And it was very sad. It was almost like walking through the places of Holocaust, going through the places of where they housed the slaves at. And, I, and, and, and all of them places where they was at, and it still sticks in my mind. I read about it. I studied it. I understood it in school. But when you walk through the places of where they lived and what they experienced, that as a mother would have a child and that child would be taken from that mother as soon as it is born and never to know where it goes again. That their marriage was not legalized because they didn't ever know if the husband or wife was going to be around another day. So they didn't ever know what was going to take place. That when they had to eat, they had to ring a bell and they ran to a feeding trough where they fed the pigs and they had to run out on their hands and knees and scoop up the food to eat it out of a trough. And when they ring the bell, they leave. Another group comes in. A place of a horrible place that they were in. A horrible place. But I learned something at that place about their faith that they had in God and how that they declared they were all God's children, regardless of white or black. And they even prayed for those that even treated them harshly and treated them so very bad. David and his man come back in their place, and in that place they look around, and all they see is destruction. They see, they see hurt. They see famine. They see peril. They come home, and there's isolation there's emptiness they're overwhelmed by sorrow and David and his men lift up their voices and the Bible says they cry and they weep until they have no more strength to weep have you ever been there before that you're so overwhelmed and so frustrated and so aggravated and, and, and so desperate for God that when you don't have anything else to cry because you've done cried it all out have you ever been in a place that that's a sad day? That's a bad day. David is somewhere in between his prophecy and his destiny. See, the reality in our life is, is God allows us to do this journey with Him. And we come to a place in our spiritual wall called Ziklag. And Ziklag is the in-between place of our prophecy, what God placed in our spirit, how we knew He told us who we were and how that we trusted Him and His Word. And then our destiny is full ruling as a king, but we ain't there yet. We're hiding in caves. We're looking at our families. We're imagining ourselves. Everything is going on. So what do you do on the worst day of your life? Let me tell you a couple of things that I encourage you to do. Now, I grew up in a, a very godly Pentecostal home. 
But I'm going to tell you something that you need to learn to do is you need to learn to weep in your life. It's okay to cry. It's okay to weep. It's okay to call out unto the Lord. I was told as a, as a kid, almost kind of, you know, uh, suck it up, buttercup, right? You know, you just got to have faith. And, and, and that faith, you're going to push on through. But that's not a reality because God created with us with emotions. And God created us with places in our life that hurts. And our, our Savior, Jesus Christ, wept when he had so I look at the story and I see David. He's in between his prophecy and between his destiny. The Bible says they wept. Some tells us weeping may endure for the night. It happens. We cry. We get overwhelmed. These men looked at their homes and I'm going to tell you, your children are lost. You ought to cry over your children that are lost. If you don't cry over them, don't expect nobody else to have a burden for your family. You ought to cry over your church. You ought to weep over your church. I remember, I remember as a child coming to prayer meetings, and, and we used to have those. You know, prayer meeting was the least attended day of the church. You have a prayer meeting. People come and they pray, and, and they come and they, they got down. And I remember, I remember coming to pray, and as they would pray, they, they would get in there, and it almost intimidated me when I heard them pray. Man, I was like, I can't pray like that. I, I don't have the words to say like that. And as they would pray, and I would begin to hear them, and I heard my own parents and times say this, the weeping, they would start weeping, and they'd start crying. And they'd sit there, and tears would be running down their face, and they would get in the altars, and, and this, this, this weeping would overwhelm them, and they would cry out to the Lord. And, and I would sit there and listen to that, and I'd be in the, I was a kid, and I probably was rolling around under the pews or something crazy, listening, in between rolling around the pews and getting pulled out to the back and getting my rear end whipped. <laughs> But in that, I heard something that I needed to learn. That you need to learn to weep. And that sometimes in life, it's okay to cry. It's okay to tell God, I can't handle it anymore. It's okay to tell God, I can't deal with all that's going on. I want you to understand, you've got to learn sometimes your place is limited and you can only go so far. And your desperation, sometimes it is dark and it is lonely. And sometimes you feel that there's nothing else to go and you've hit rock bottom and you're at the end of your rope and, and you've made it to Heartbroke Hotel and nobody was there. His family was gone. His associates was gone. No matter what the tragedy has visited our life, we've got to learn something inside of us that our destiny our eternal purpose is that God has brought it to reveal his joy and satisfaction you need to cry but don't stay there crying don't sit in that place and weep and weep and weep you've got to move from weeping to refreshing you've got to move from a place where tears flow you've got to say God help me to know what you're doing but in that place of to refreshing learn this guard your heart from bitterness guard your heart from bitterness inside of you because when you get to a place in your soul where you said God you've prophesied to me you've put it in my spirit I know what it's supposed to be I know how it's supposed to look my child's going to be saved but last night they called me from the magistrate they want me to come and post bail I, I, I know that I'm supposed to get out of debt you've told me to do this and that but now the bills are coming in I've lost my job they're telling me I'm losing my house Lord you've told me that I'm supposed to preach your gospel you've told me that I'm supposed to do this and do that but Lord I don't know how I can do it because all of this problems is going on guard your heart from bitterness because bitterness is something that will grow inside of you. The Bible says, And David was distressed, for the people spake of stoning him. Verse 6, Because the soul of all the people were grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. The process of recovery requires us to have grace to offer to forgiveness to others. See, when people live in bitterness, they play this blame game. It's everybody else's problem and not mine. It's everybody else's reason where I'm at today. Don't you see that in our world today? Everybody's throwing rocks at everybody. Everybody's angry at everybody. Everybody's mad at everybody. Everybody's frustrated at everybody. Everybody's upset, and they don't even know why they're upset for. They're just mad. They're angry. You get on that 77, you're going to see more birds on 77 than you see in a lot of places out there in Florida. You're going to, I, everybody is angry. 
Everybody's mad. Ephesians 4, 31 says, Let all bitterness and all wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15 says, Looking diligently, lest any man fall of the grace of God. Least anyone let a root of bitterness spring up in trouble that you may be defiled. When offenses happen, write this down, put it in your heart. When troubles come to your life, don't curse it, don't nurse it, don't rehearse it, but disperse it and reverse it. Let me say that again. Don't curse it, don't nurse it, don't rehearse it, but disperse it and reverse it. Because bitterness will try to get into your soul. And while you're sitting in church and you're wanting something from God, something's going to come across your way that's going to try to take your joy, that's going to try to take your victory, that's going to try to steal your promise that He has. Now, I want to move on a little bit more. This would have been the most dramatic places in my life. David lost his, he lost his children. He lost his family. The men that are following him, that love him and care about him, are now saying, David, we hate you and we're going to stone you and we're going to kill you because you have called us to battle and while we left our families to do what you wanted us to do we come back and we our families are not here our homes are destroyed our lives are messed up and we don't know what's going on David could have said okay guys I give up I was trying my best I don't know what to do I don't know how to do it just go on and throw the towel in hide behind the windows close the curtains and say I give up but David David didn't do that. Let me tell you what happens when trouble comes. Let me tell you when your revival is over Wednesday night. There's something you're going to have to learn to do to have revival Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday night, all through next week and the rest of the year. It is, David said, in the middle of his trouble, in the middle of his trial, in the middle of his pain. Verse he says, but David encouraged and strengthened himself in the Lord his God. This is why I love the Word. This is why I love the scriptures because it shows me this dramatic major issue that's going on the love of a child of God he says guess what I'm not giving up on you I'm not quitting on you I'm not throwing in the, in the towel but I'm going to trust you God in the worst day of my life I'm going to trust you when I don't feel revival I've come to five services and I'm as dead as I was at the beginning of revival but I'm going to trust you God I gave when I didn't have the gift I got less money in my bank. I'm poorer than I've ever been. But I'm going to trust you, God. I'm going to keep on giving. I'm going to keep on praying. I'm going to keep on fasting. I'm going to keep on singing. I'm going to keep on worshiping. I'm going to keep on dancing. I'm going to keep on declaring that you are my God. I may not see it. I may not feel it. I may not understand it. But I trust you, God. And I'm going to get down where I am at. And I'm going to lift up my hands. And I'm going to praise and magnify God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The Bible says that David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. What we got to learn to do is we got to learn to stop depending on somebody else to lead us there. We got to stop depending on somebody else to do it there. You know what the church is? The church ain't nothing but a refill station. It's just to fill a little bit of gas to keep on going on. But I want you to understand something. You've got to maintain your car outside of the gas stations. You've got to take care of your spiritual walk with God. You've got to seek Him. You've got to spend time with Him. You've got to worship Him. You've got to pray and speak His Word over your family and over your life. You know, I look at how alarming our world is. You cannot only maintain this in your life. I can't figure it out. My, my man's brain's got this little shrunken in piece between the left side and the right side. I forget what it's called. But our, our thoughts can't run back and forth like women's has. When women says, what are you thinking? They're like, I'm thinking this and that. What are you thinking? I'm like, I'm on this side right now and this side's like nothing I'm thinking about nothing I'm really not I, I, I can't get it from this side to this side and, and to think about something I'm just looking at the wall I'm just thinking of nothing at all <laughs> the problem is in our life is this is that when we can't get our brain to get to where our spirit is you're going to have to stop and letting your brain control your spirit you got to stop allowing your mind 
to control what your spirit does. But your spirit's going to have to lead your soul. Your spirit's going to have to lead your mind. See, our soul is our personality. Our soul is our, our, our ideas, our brain, our mind. We are a body, a soul, and a spirit. We are three-part being. God made us that way. Praise the Lord. Our bodies die. They go to the ground. Our soul, what we experience, our feelings, those things in life, that dies. But our spirit, whether we go to heaven or hell, whatever that is, it lives for eternity. That spirit on the inside of you that's working inside of you. You need to say, Lord, I'll lift up my voice and I'll praise you. I'll sing. I'll dance. I'll keep on trusting you, God. There's times that at the beginning of church service, I felt as dead as dead could be. I sat there in service and I'm like, man, I'm the preacher. I ought to feel something. I'll be honest and transparent. This ain't my church. I'll just tell you the truth here and I've, I'm not here but I, I feel the Lord. I've been in my service where I've went up there and I've played and I've got up there and I've preached and I've got halfway through my message and I said I know it stinks. I know it ain't no good. I'm as dead on the inside as I am on the outside but somewhere in that process I allowed the word of God to keep going out in front of me and I kept trusting God and I said Lord I'm going to keep believing. I'm going to keep trusting and before I knew it I I didn't allow my mind, my emotions, and my feelings, but I met God, and God met me, and the Holy Ghost comes down, and he touches. There's times in my life, my wife will tell you, I get discouraged, I get overwhelmed, I get frustrated, aggravated, I beat myself up, and I'm in the boxing max, and I'm beating myself up. I'm tearing myself down, and she'll say, you need not to be like that, and I'll say, well, this is the way it is, this is how I feel, this is what I'm going through, I'm real, maybe you you ain't, but I'm real. I got life's heaviness on me, troubles and trials, all of these things facing. And I said, Lord, but I'm going to trust you. I remember this year, I got sick with the flu. I never had the flu in my life. I got sick with the flu. The flu turned into bronchitis. Bronchitis turned into pneumonia. Pneumonia turned into where I had got MRSA in my lungs, and then my lungs filled with blood clots. Doctors kept calling me, you need to go to the hospital. You can die at any moment. I'm like, what in the world? Called my clerk. I said, I need you to get me. He lived right down the road. I said, please don't hit no speed bumps on the way to the, to the hospital. <laughs> I didn't want one of them things to die. I didn't want to die like that. I didn't want to go out for speed bump killing me. You know, if I'm going to die, I'll put a, put a gun in my hand. Send me over there and let me fight like a man. I'm not going to die like, like that. <laughs> I, I don't want to die like this is a blood clot hitting my heart and my lung and taking me out. That ain't no fight. I remember my heart was overwhelmed. Doctors talking about cancers. Had these, had all of these uh, nodules in my lungs. I'm sitting in there in the hospital room. My wife's with me. I'm sitting there and I'm saying, "Oh Lord, what in the world's going on?" Doctor comes in here. Man, I had three of them. I had I don't know four or five. They all said and done. One doctor says you got blood clots. This is going. Another doctor comes in. I'm sitting there on the thing. They're popping needles in my belly and they're, they're shooting me full of blood thinners and um, IVs. And I'm sick and I don't feel good and I'm thinking I'm going to die. And I left the house and my kids are crying. I'm crying. I'm blowed out of shape. I, I, I'm like, what in the world's going on? And I sit there. And the next doctor comes in. This this little Indian guy. He looks at me, and just as cold hearted, I'm sitting out in the hall. The hospital's so full. He says, well, it looks like you have cancer. I'm like, what? This ain't how you tell me in the middle of the... This was a few months ago, guys. And I'm like, what? And I sit there, and I'm like, help me, God. I go up to the room. They put me in there. They're shooting IVs in me. I'm on all this antibiotics. I'd then been in the hospital a week prior to that, and they let me go. And I had them then, but they didn't catch them. I got up and preached, and I was hurting in my back. I was just bad, messed up, sick. I'm sitting in the room thinking, God, you're going to take my life. What's going on? I don't know how I'm going to make it. And in all of that, my wife's sitting there encouraged. Our overseer comes, and our state overseer comes into the room. And thank God at that time, he walked in there, and he prayed with me. And I'm sitting there, and I got on WebMD. If you get a bad doctor's note, don't be getting on the Internet. <laughs> Lord, don't get on the Internet. That's, that's a killer. Don't be diagnosing yourself. You didn't go to college. I'm sitting there looking at all this stuff. I'm laying in the bed thinking, I'm going to die. They told me I'm coming in the morrow, putting a needle in my back, cutting in my back, and taking biopsies out of my lungs. And I'm like, all I had was the flu. What in the world happened? How did we get to this place? And that night I sat there, and I had to come to a place in my own heart. My wife was over there. She wasn't sleeping. Her nerves were shot. Mine was shot. 
And I said to myself, and I sat there, and after I'd been webbing MD until like 3 or 4 in the morning, I can't sleep when you get news like that and you're in the hospital, and they got all these IVs and doctors keep coming in, and, and they're like, what's going on? And I sat there at one point in, this, in that night, and I said, Lord, whatever your will is, I'm going to have to trust you. Not knowing what tomorrow holds, but I'm going to have to trust you, God. I'm going to tell you, my, my mind did not feel like trusting God. My, my, my flesh didn't feel like trusting God. I got IVs, bags, I got sick, I don't feel good. I, I'm, I'm, they're telling me I'm dying. I, I, I don't, this ain't good. But I said, I got to trust you, God. And I remember sitting there that night at the hospital room with the lights off, and I was praying, and I said, God, help me to believe you and your word. And then that night, I sat there and allowed the Holy Spirit to bring peace to my life. But let me tell you this about that. That it is not a journey of, of our battle that we win today that we don't have to fight tomorrow. Because that old same devil that comes against you today is going to try to knock on your door tomorrow. And you may win today, but that enemy is going to come a different way tomorrow. And he's going to challenge you again. And he's going to face you again. And, and, and if you allow your life to be moved, that every time something comes, and, and you may cry, and I cried. I, I cried. I had headaches. and I cried, and I was upset. And I'm sitting there feeling what in the world is going on. I cried, but I had to stop crying. And I had to put my trust in God. And say, the worst thing that can happen to me is I meet Jesus. The worst thing that can happen is... I meet Jesus. Now, I have a story and a testimony that, that I, I, I am thankful for what God has done in my life. I've walked through some dark places in my life, some very dark places and some very hurtful places. And in them places that I had to be at, I had, I, there's been times, and my church knows this, and I've said this to them before, there was times in my church and in my life and in my own walk with God that I had to have my parents drag me out of my house to have me come up and get up and preach. Because my life was crumbling. And everything that I knew and held on to was gone. And what I believed was true was a lie. And all of that, I had to get over there and preach the Word of God. And trust the Word of God. And not depend on my feelings, but depend on Him. Let me tell you what you got to do, guys. you got to learn to find a place in Him that is beyond what you're dealing with. Can I musicians come? I want to close. You, you've got to learn to encourage yourself in the Lord. Let me tell you what revival is. Revival is something that happens in our own personal life. I used to say this when I was an evangelist. I said, if you want a revival, everybody take a, a, an imaginary mark or a piece of chalk. And I said, take it and just spin it around you. And say, God, start revival right here. Because the revival won't come here. Until revival comes here. And I believe that is the heartbeat of your pastor. I believe that is the heartbeat of this church. And of this ministry. To allow the spirit of God to come in your way. Let me close with this scripture. Although the fig tree shall not blossom. Neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail. And the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold. And there shall be no herd in the stalls. Let me say that one more time. Habakkuk 3.17 Though the fig tree does not blossom, though there's no fruit in the vines, that the olive fails, the fields yield no meat, and the flock is cut off from the fold, and there is no herd in the stall, meaning there's no money in the bank, there's no food in the refrigerator, there's no family, there's, no, there's nothing that's any good at all. Verse 18 says this, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. He said, don't allow your circumstances to cause you to lose your joy. Don't allow your circumstances to cause you to lose your praise. You lift up your hands. You magnify the Son of God. You worship Him in spirit and in truth. You don't allow your troubles and your trials and your problems and your adversities to take your praise. He said, but if everything's gone, if you've lost it all, if you have nothing that you can account for, that is good. He said, you keep praising the Lord. You keep rejoicing in the Lord. You keep knowing that the joy of God is your salvation. Hear me, church, tonight. Lift those hands. Uh, we, all over them pews, will you lift those hands up? Say, Father, I'm going to keep worshiping you. I'm going to keep praising you. I'm going to keep honoring you. I'm going to keep declaring that you are God in this place. 
in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Will you stand all over this house? Come on, we're going to lift our hands up toward Him. We're going to lift our hands up toward the Lord.